Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Thornburn, Professor of Comparative Literature and East Asian Languages and Civilizations at Harvard University. I'll be chairing our panel today. Our panel is titled Conspiracies and Coalitions in Japanese Environmental Humanities. This panel is generously sponsored by the Japan Foundation. It features scholars from a range of disciplines who explore conspiracies and coalitions to heal bodies human and non-human. Thank you to our Japan Foundation colleagues, Nobu Minagawa, Genevieve Savage, and Annie Waldman for making this panel possible. All our panelists will speak for about 11 minutes, which will leave us time for discussion at the end. First to present today will be Professor John Pitt. Professor Pitt is Assistant Professor of East Asian Studies at the University of California, Irvine. Second today will be Professor Alisa Paredes. Professor Paredes is soon to be Assistant Professor of Anthropology at the University of Michigan. Third to speak today will be Professor Wakana Suzuki. Professor Suzuki is Assistant Professor in the Department of Evolutionary Studies of Biosystems at the Graduate University of Advanced Studies, Japan. And fourth on our panel today will be Professor Daichi Sugai. Professor Sugai is Associate Professor in the Faculty of Economics at Matsuyama University in Japan. Following these four presentations, we'll have comments from our two discussants. The first discussant to present will be Professor Satsuki Takahashi. Professor Takahashi is Professor of Sustainability Studies at Hosei University in Japan. And our final discussant will be Professor Sakura Christmas. Professor Christmas is Assistant Professor of History and Asian Studies at Bowdoin College in the United States. Um, so our Japan-based colleagues, Professor Suzuki, uh, Sugai, and Takahashi uh, were, were joining via Zoom rather than person, but they too uh, very much will appreciate your comments and questions. I'd like to stop here and turn the floor over to Professor John Pitt. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is John Pitt, and my talk today is titled Sharing the Air to Spare the Air, Yasui Takaya's Plant People Conspiracy on the Ogasawara Archipelago. At a thousand kilometers southeast of Tokyo, the Ogasawara Islands are among the most remote of the Japanese archipelago. Two of Ogasawara's islands are currently inhabited, Chichijima, with a population of around 2,000, and Hahajima, with between 450 to 500 human inhabitants. To visit, one must take a ferry that leaves once a week from Tokyo and takes a full 24 hours to reach Chichijima. And due to their isolated location in the Pacific Ocean, the islands are home to a large number of endemic species, both animal and plant. Now endemic species are those that have evolved in a single geographical location. The islands have indeed been called the Galapagos of Asia in reference to the islands that were foundational to Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. So the unique and fragile biodiversity of Ogasawara's endemic species resulted in the island's designation as UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2011. When Rafi Yuat writes of endemic species place within global biodiversity as emphasizing, quote, the idea of cloistered survival in a world of continual erasure, end quote, he could well be speaking of Ogasawara. But bureaucratically speaking, Ogasawara is a part of Tokyo. And in the wake of Japan's post-war economic recovery and the reversion of the islands from American military occupation in 1968, infrastructure development on Chichijima and Hahajima gained traction with the Tokyo Metropolitan Government. With the economic boom born of the 1980s bubble economy, the Metropolitan Government began to consider building an airport somewhere on the Ogasawara Archipelago. In 1988, Anijima, an island with no human inhabitants just north of Chichijima, was singled out. And three years later, an airport development plan was made official. As Nanyan Guo and Gavin McCormick outline in a 2001 article, this plan was met with resistance, both domestic and international. In the case of Ogasawara, such resistance worked. To this day, there is no commercial airport anywhere on the islands, even as new plans for construction continue to surface from Tokyo, most recently in 2018. My brief talk today focuses on a leading voice within the movement to halt airport construction on Ogasawara that of botanist, conservationist, and former school teacher Yasui Takaya. 
I intend to align Yasui's activism and in particular his advocacy on behalf of Ogasawara's endemic plant life with the notion of conspiracy as developed by science and technology scholar Tim Choi and critical plant theorist Natasha Myers. For both Choi and Myers, the etymological roots of the word conspiracy open up new potential for collaboration across species, a breathing together that entangles human and more than human bodies within an unequally shared atmosphere. In his deployment of the term conspiracy, Choi states an interest in, quote, what different modes of reckoning with breath, breathing, and breathers might do for a speculative project of collectivizing response to massive pattern forms of environmental violence, end quote. My talk today is a speculative project of this kind. I'm trying to think about Yasui's writing and activism as something born of a multi-species collective in response and indeed in opposition to the environmental violence of airport construction. Such violence might not seem massive to us humans, but from a plant's perspective, development on this level is massive indeed. Natasha Myers contends that, quote, it is time to extend Choi's call for a conspiracy of breathers to include the plants. That is, we need to learn not just how to collaborate, but also how to conspire with the plants, to breathe with them. Remember, they breathed us into being, end quote. My contention is that Yasui anticipated this call some 30 years ago. In his activism, we witnessed a form of conspiratorial resistance founded on a collective of human and more than human actors aligned in the process of breathing, tied together through the give and take that comprises the very air that is threatened by the potential construction of an airport. As an advocate for the intrinsic importance of biodiversity bound up in endemism, which is an importance not tied to resource extraction or use value more generally, Yasui has learned to leverage his status as a botanist uh, with the status of Ogasawada's plant life as endemic and largely endangered to halt a seemingly unstoppable drive towards progress and development. In 1996, he delivered a speech which outlines his plant people conspiracy. He laid out two objectives to remove Anijima from consideration as the site of airport construction and to get the municipal government to scale back the size of the airport plan in favor of creating an air route better suited to the daily life of Ogasawara residents. In other words, he explains, quote, I would like us to think about the Ogasawara air corridor from the perspective of its inhabitants, end quote. Yasui makes clear that by inhabitants, he is not referring only to human inhabitants. He explains that, quote, due to the particular composition of Ogasawada's natural environment, in order to think through the issue of environmental impact, I think we should look at things from the perspective of the plants, end quote. Yasui reminds his audience that over 40% of the native species on Ogasawada are endemic species only found on the islands. And so endemic species are foundational to Yasui's activism. And we see this further in what is arguably his most effective work of resistance, a list of plants uh, populating the second proposed site for airport construction. This list, which was published independently in 1998, conflicted with the official governmental survey of the Shigureyama area of Chichijima. Yasui's list highlights the fact that of the 60 species he encountered in the proposed construction site, half are considered threatened species. But if we return to Yasui's 1996 speech, we see a curious move in which the uniqueness of endemic species becomes subsumed into the collective conspiracy. Quote, we cannot see living things as singular species. Researchers of biology view living things as being composed by an ecosystem with a mutually and organically entangled form. From this point of view, the desire to remove Anijima, a place where the natural ecosystem remains, from the list of candidates for airport construction is not just the conclusion of biologists, but of all people who intend to value the nature of Ogasawara." End quote. And so through conspiracy, Yasui is able to explode the very idea of an individuated species while simultaneously arguing for the rights of the endemic species in particular. 
It's worth noting once again that this strategy has proven effective thus far in resisting airport development. And in Natasha's Meyer, Natasha Myers' words, in, quote, growing a livable world, end quote, for humans and plants alike. But it's also worth noting that not all plants are drawn into Yasui's plant people conspiracy. And the world said conspiracy has helped preserve has not been livable for all concerned. In a 1999 article that Yasui wrote for the periodical Puranta, titled The Creeping Threats to Ogasawara Plant Life, non-native plants that have naturalized to the islands since World War II are vilified as having caused great damage to the forest floor of Chichijima. In 2013, Yasui co-authored a report on an 11-year project of planting endemic trees in hopes of reducing the number of, quote, invasive species, end quote. If Yasui's conspiracy asks us to look at things from the perspective of the plants, are we also being asked to ignore the perspective of those plants deemed non-native? Now, this is a thorny issue one that may expose the limits of Choi and Myers' uh, figuration of conspiracy as collectivizing response to environmental violence. Yasui's conspiracy makes us question the composition of said environmental violence. Is the encroachment of non-native species a form of violence against endemic species? Is the removal of non-native species a form of violence as well? Natasha Myers would probably say yes, and that we should, quote, start by letting plants grow where they want to, let them break through the concrete, root into every fissure and surface, grow through the holes in every fence." End quote. Now, Myers is thinking botanically here, from the bottom up. But what happens when we think from the top down, from the air to the ground? And how can we continue to see the shared air of conspiracy as a radical medium of multi-species resistance when it is the air itself that poses a threat to endemic plant life, as seabirds bring invasive plant seeds and non-native honeybees disrupt native pollination networks on Ogasawara. My talk today can only broach these questions. And so I will conclude with a reminder from Choi that quote, conspiracy implies a commitment to breathing together from and in an unequally shared milieu an unevenly constituted planetary medium for respiration where concentrations of well and unwell being accumulate differentially, end quote. And so it seems in conspiracy as in biodiversity, difference ultimately makes all the difference. Thank you. Hello everyone. And thank you so much for your interest in this Japan Foundation sponsored panel called Conspiracies and Coalitions in the Japanese Environmental Humanities. My name is Alisa Paredes and I'm an environmental and economic anthropologist at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Uh, and the title of my talk is There is no Circle of Poison. Chemical drift is arguably the most infamous debris of the banana supply chain connecting consumer markets in Japan with the production regions in the Philippines. These chemical droplets released from lightweight aircrafts suspended in the air and carried by the wind are an externality par excellence. Previously, I've written about a Philippines-based anti-aerial spraying campaign emerging around plantations in response to these unjust externalizations. Today, I want to recount the story from the perspective of Japan-based organizations working to support their Filipino activist partners. Most prominent among these groups are the Pacific Asia Resource Center, or Ajia Taihei Yoshiri Osenta, a Tokyo-based nonprofit with a focus on the Asian region, as well as consumer cooperative systems, including the ones you see listed on the slide. To date, these organizations have dedicated a remarkable amount of energy to the anti-aerial spraying cause, carrying out field-based studies, hosting public seminars, demonstrating in front of the offices of powerful corporations like Sumitomo, uh, launching a website and producing a documentary film. Much of their work aims to show the Japanese public how chemical residues link producers and consumers in contingent pathways of harm. Two questions have lingered in my mind while navigating this transnational network. When chemical objects cross borders, do they promise to connect communities in the pursuit of transnational justice? 
or do they further disconnect them across biopolitically asymmetrical divides? What challenges confront transnational environmental activism when the environments that spark protest or that spark political contention are not shared equally across nation state borders? To address these questions, I reflect on the metaphor of a circle of poison, or in Japanese, doku no saikuru, which is rhetoric often summoned by activists who operate in these spaces. I began thinking about these questions while delivering talks uh, about the Philippine anti-aerial spraying campaign to audiences in Japan. The picture you see before you was taken at a cafe in a public intellectual space in Kokubunji in Tokyo. In these presentations, I often spoke about the everyday experiences of folks living near the plantations that supplied the Japanese market. One story I often relayed was of a man from Cotabato province in the Southern Philippines who had developed progressive paralysis as a result of his daily exposure to, the, to these fungicidal sprays. The man's daughter, Nasifa, shown here, had expressed a desire to address folks abroad, so I gladly recorded her message and played it for them. As I aired Nasifa's message before audiences of Japanese housewives, mothers, and activists, as well as reg regular ca um, cafe clientele just stopping by, um, I noticed that the room tended to well up with emotion. Several members of the audience came up to me afterwards to express their shock and dismay at never having heard about these issues before. So when I returned to the Southern Philippines uh, and was reunited with Nasifa, as well as a common friend of ours named Ibi, I reported, reported to them that I had successfully shared Nasifa's message uh, abroad to Japanese, um, Japanese citizens. And what was their response? Uh, Ibi asked me uh, pointedly. Well, you know, they cried and uh, they were very shocked because they said they had no idea was how I answered. This seemed to give Ibi some pause. Oh, really? She retorted somewhat incredulously as if suggesting that she found the Jap these Japanese consumers naivete about the processes in which they were complicit somewhat hard to believe. When Nasifa finally spoke up, her response pushed the conversation further. And she said, well, if we breathe this, by which she meant the chemicals, they, the Japanese, they eat it. They literally put it straight in their mouths. In Nasifa's provocation, pesticide residues emerge as the deliverers of transnational justice, linking Filipino and Japanese communities in a shared fate of chemical exposure and ingestion. This idea is a dominant mode in which the public has come to understand how pesticides connect consumer and producer communities, and it has a long-standing provenance. 40 years ago, the American journalists David Weir and Mark Shapiro popularized the term circle of poison to describe the looping paths of pe banned pesticides as they were manufactured in the US, um, subsequently banned domestically for the dangers that they posed, sold in overseas markets, and eventually circling, circled back to American consumers through imported food. Much like Nasifa's suggestion, if we breathe it, they eat it, the no this notion captures what Ulrich Beck would have called a boomerang effect that ensures that victimizers do not escape with impunity. In the words of we Veer and Shapiro, we in the global north are victims too. This is what makes the circle of poison such a captivating metaphor. It frames the global pesticide complex as a network of complicity and interconnected harm. Unveiling these networks obscured by commodity form and fetish has long been at the center of Japanese civil society's efforts to engage the Asian region. The Pacific Asia Resource Center, which I mentioned earlier, uh, exemplifies this. With roots in new left activism uh, of the anti-Vietnam War movement, uh, or Beheren, uh, Park has continued to appeal to an Asian Shimin imaginary in their advocacy. This is, uh, these are uh, concepts used, uh, taken from Simon Avenel's work. Historically, activists in it have highlighted how the insistence on safe and healthy standards of living in Japan was indirectly entangled with pollution export to places like Southeast Asia. 
as Avenel has expertly noted. Activists of this generation, active in Beheren, who I got to know through Park, listed many examples of the developments they mobilized against, say, uh, many of the, of the developments they mobilized against, including Kawasaki Steel Corporation's re relocation from Chiba Prefecture to Northern Mindanao in the Philippines, or Mitsubishi Glass Company uh, uh, and their relocation to Bangkok, etc. This spirit of drawing Japan and Southeast Asia together in a circle of connection has continued to motivate Japanese civil society's engagements with the Philippine aerial spray issue today. And yet, the so-called circle of poison begs empirical investigation. Does it in fact obscure more than it reveals? Geographer Ryan Galt has forcefully uh, argued against this characterization as it simply does not capture the profound imbalances in regulatory structures between producers and consumers. When thinking about these imbalances between the Philippines and Japan specifically, um, maximum residue limits or MRLs offer a poignant way to visualize uh, why this so-called circle of poison is largely fictitious. So in the image that you see um, in front of you, the tiny red dot on the cube is a visual representation of one parts per million relative to a single object. Now parts per million or PPM uh, is the unit of measure that's used for maximum residue limits uh, on and in imported food. And these are basically the amounts of uh, chemicals that are uh, legally allowed to remain uh, on the surface of food uh, after it's imported. For Japan, the maximum residue limits for chemicals used on banana plantations range from 0.07 to four parts per million. So imagine then 0.07 to four parts per million, or sorry, 0.07 to four times the size of that tiny red dot uh, in proportion to the size of one banana. Basically my point here is very simple. It's, it's microscopic, right? So you take now take that tiny microscopic dot of chemical residue that Japanese consumers are allowed to legally ingest and compare it to the kinds of chemical drenching that Filipinos living near banana plantations experience twice a week. Then you'd have a pretty accurate visualization of the high levels of protection that are awarded to, a Japanese, to Japanese consumers compared to their Filipino counterparts. There really is no circle of poison with which to speak. So the reason I care about this, um, the reason I care about this is not only because the circle of poison fails to represent material realities across borders, but also because it tends to delimit meaningful transnational political action. Take an educational video produced by PAL System. This is a large consumer cooperative headquartered in Tokyo uh, as one case in point. So in this educational video, uh, a Japanese mother shares the following reflection. She says, I'd never asked myself what exactly about chemicals is bad and what kinds of problems is this causing for producers? Bananas are the kinds of food that children love to eat with their own hands. That's why I've come to feel very strongly that it's important for me to choose um, food that is reliable and safe, or anshin and anzen. Uh, these are terms that have been already forcefully, forcefully analyzed by Nico Sternstoff Susterna and Aya Kimura, uh, among others. Now, so this is where the, you know, the quote gets pretty interesting, right? Um, the Japanese mother says, for my own child, and for the people of the world, I feel that one must have discerning eyes as a consumer." End quote. So here you see how Japanese consumer groups evoke the idea of chemical circularity in the ways that they imagine harm against the other as in fact harm against themselves, against their children, and against their families. The video's final frame ends with a question, which banana will you choose? Right? This kind of question really encapsulates what I think of as a very common conceit of neoliberal approaches to conscious consumerism, which tends to be based on sort of mythical ideas about how supply chains work. In it, 
the chemical destinies faced by, quote, my own child and, quote, the people of the world are equalized and linked by one's individual consumer choices. In truth, encouraging consumers to have discerning eyes as they go about their shopping does very little to change the patterns of chemical overuse on plantations that source the Japanese market. So in closing, I wanna end on a note that inspired um, and an idea that inspired our panel in the first place. Timothy Choi, an anthropologist, offered the notion of a conspiracy of breathers, noting that the word conspiracy comes from the Latin root word meaning breathing with. This is provocative conceptual language, given news we now regularly receive of fires and smoke sending smog across borders, like in these images of Indonesia and Malaysia. Yet Choi also warns us that we live in an atmospheric uncommons where atmospheres do not equalize and where breathing together rarely means breathing the same, in his words. Indeed, the circle of poison between the Philippines and Japan is largely a rhetorical device that can be deeply misleading. To me, this begs the question, can we have, can there be a political praxis based on coalition, even in the absence of circularity, connectivity, or contingent harm? What would it take, Choi asks, and what would it do? to face the conditions of distribution where I inhale the cough or choke of another." End quote. I think this, is, this type of question is deeply important and one that the environmental humanities of Japan, of Japanese studies, is uniquely equipped to address. Thank you so much. Um, again, my name is Elisa Paredes, uh, and I would love to hear from any of you with any questions or comments you may have uh, on this talk. Thank you again for your time. Hi, everyone. My name is Wakana Suzuki. Before I begin, I would like to thank uh, Japan Foundation and Professor Thromber for organizing this panel. I'm very sorry that I cannot attend the conference uh, in person because of COVID-19 and family limitations. I hope this panel and our discussion will be very fruitful for everyone. In this presentation, I focus on human micro relationships and explore the fermentation practices of a small bakery shop in Japan through the lens of environmental humanities. I put uh, my email address here. I'm very happy to receive any comments and questions regarding to my research. In my ongoing ethnographic research, I am looking at how people in a small town in Japan make livable worlds for both human and non-humans in the era of Anthropocene. I'm using method and concept of multi-species ethnography within anthropology and STS to focus on the practice of one particular bakery shop in southern eastern Japan. One concept is especially useful for me in thinking about the relationship between human and microbes in bakery is inspired by Tim Choi's concept of conspire, which Natasha Myers uses when discussing the relationship between plants and humans. Myers insists that plants are the most powerful agents of elementary rearrangement on the earth. They compose and decompose the atmosphere through photosynthesis. They draw nutrition from soil and falling leaves become compost and feed the soil. Inspired by her argument, I mainly focus human microbial relationship and how, we, how, re, how they rearrange elements of each other. Later in the presentation, I expand as a relationship that the baker have with the elements of their wider environment, such as soil, water, and forest. Talmari is a bakery and cafe surrounded by forest and rice fields in the small town in Tottori Prefecture. The owners are Watanabe's shown in this picture. 
The Watanabe's combined husband name, Itaru, and wife's name, Mariko, to come up with the name Tarumari. The Watanabe started their bakery near Tokyo 15 years ago. Then they moved to Tottori, which is known for having a clean atmosphere and pure water, which they realized uh, they needed to bake their bread. Since it was very difficult to conduct field work uh, due to COVID-19, I collected data mainly through internet. The Watanabes have published two books and have a lot of exposure in media. They actively join various talk shows, which are easily accessible on YouTube. I relied on such digital data for my research. Tarumari is unique in their style of fermentation. For 15 years, they have explored how to use wild yeast rather than industrialized yeast. Normally, uh, Japanese bakery, bakeries, like many around the world, use an industrialized yeast. That's because it is easy to handle and enable bakers to produce abundant amount of bread without failing. Industrialized yeast consists of one kind of yeast, which is isolated from many other swarms of yeast. On the other hand, Tarumari use wild yeast in the forest or rice fields that they find by themselves. Wild yeast are very weak and they do not match with industrialized wheat. Therefore, Watanabe's have tested various kinds of wheat and water, and they tried out many recipes. Because these wild yeast often fail to ferment or bake properly, they can sell very limited number of bread every day. This is why they need to listen to the voice of micro very carefully. Gradually, Watanabe realized that to make good wild yeast bread, it was important to arrange the environment to be conductive for the uh, wild yeast to thrive. When they took wild yeast from the rice field next to the wild, uh, wide road where many cars, com cars come and go, for example, they noticed the yeast could not ferment very well. So to ensure they could maintain clean soil, water and air, they started to engage in some local activities to keep their environment clean. For instance, when they renovate old house for their bakery and cafe, they used local woods, which were raised in the same town. After they learned how to grow vegetables without using pesticide and fertilizer from local farmers in this area, they started to grow vegetable and wheat using same method. Not only buying and using materials such as wood and wheat or vegetables, but Amanabes tried to collaborate with the local people and engage their local problems. Mariko uses a Buddhist word N when she explained how they arrange their environment. N or the related concept of engi, it's difficult to translate. M is Buddhist term, which denote external causes. M connotate ties or relations, invisible order beyond human knowledge, which from uh, which form webs around all things in the universe. One can neither predict or nor comprehend the design and work of N. However, through uh, usually invisible, the thread that connect human and non-human may be brought and brought to attention through unexpected meetings. Itaru explains it this way. When we care for working environment for our staff, natural environment and keep our bakery clean, fermentation goes well. In other words, rather than concentrating only on 
their effort to make bread, they see engaging with villagers, changing the working style, and arranging environmental infrastructures, such as river, forest, as key to making good bread and enjoy, ensuring good fermentation. To conclude here, by returning briefly to Choi and Myers, I would argue that the bakery has found a way to take part of process in the process, process, processes of elemental rearrangement by listening to the voice of microbes, as well as the nearby forest, soil, and waters. When we think about the relationship between nature and humans, it is notable that Watanabe's do not see what they are doing as protecting their environment instead of instead as a concept of end shows they engage arrange and care for their environment and then wait something happen i think in this sense end is very interesting concept not only for thinking about entanglement between human and non-humans but also between subjectivity and objectivity and does not insist on subjectivity of individual I who act on the world. Rather, and put importance on arranging relationship between subject and object and waiting for something happen out of these interconnections. And emphasizes entrusting someone or something else with one's fate. As I continue exploring this topic, I would also delve into the concept of N or NG further. That's all for now. Thank you for listening. Yeah, as I said uh, Aria, I'm very happy to receive any comments and suggestions. Please send uh, an email to my email address here. Thank you for listening. Bye. Hello, I'm Daichi Sugai. Thanks for having me, but I'm sorry that I cannot attend the session in person. First of all, I thank the Japan Foundation for their support and also thank organizer Karen for your leadership. Um, I'm so happy to join this session um, and discuss the topic with you all. Okay, well, to consider the air and the concept of breathing together, I'd like to focus on the fictional adaptations of the wind form. Kaze no denwa in Japanese. The phone booth was built by garden designer Sasaki Itaru, who owns the garden in Otsuchi, Iwate Prefecture. He built this booth to heal his sense of loss after he lost his cousin to cancer, which means it originally had nothing to do with the Tohoku earthquake. However, after the disaster, the phone has been attracted thousands of visitors who lost their loved ones. They can hold a conversation with the dead in the booth. According to Sasaki, although the phone is disconnected, their emotions are carried on the wind. Sasaki's statement is important when we think of the relationship between our emotions and the air, because it suggests that air is an essential medium for morning work. I think scrutinizing the relationship between personal emotions and the air will contribute to the discussion of environmental humanities, which tries to reorient human non-human relationships. Some eco-critics, such as Heather Hauser and Ursula K. Heiser, witness that emotions like mourning or grief could link the micro-scale individual issues with the macro-scale planetary aspects. Regarding the air, Timothy Choi argues that air is the substance that enables personal and political claims to be scaled up to global environmental politics and down to the politics of health. Moreover, in David Abrams' The Spell of the Sensuous, he observes the air was once felt to be the matter of awareness, and that awareness was originally felt as that which invisibly joined human beings to the other animals and to the plants, to the forest, and to the mountains. He uses the past tense here, which connotes that 
we already lose this kind of sense today. However, paying attention to the air could restore this kind of feeling and could be a chance to reconsider our relationship to the environment. I argue that the work of personal mourning opens up to the outside through the sharing of the air. I mainly scrutinize some portrayals of sharing the air in the movie, The Windophone. I think the scenes of breathing together reveal not only the process of personal healing, but also political aspects. Sharing the atmosphere drives the narrative in the movie and brings macro scale issues into their conversations. Breathing together in a particular space enables those, those who have depressed feelings to share their emotions and find a way of healing. At the same time, emotional sharing entails political connotation, which offers us to remember incomplete recovery from disastrous event. Since I don't have much time, I want to mention a novel related to this topic. Laura Imai Messina's novel, The Phone Booth at the Edge of the World, deals with the wind of on, and Messina seems to emphasize that sharing the same space or breathing together plays an essential role in healing. Messina is an Italian novelist who lives in Japan. In 2020, the novel was released and published in over 20 countries. The protagonist, Yui, is a DJ at a local radio station, and she lost her mother and daughter in the tsunami in 2011. She knows about the wind phone from a listener's letter to Yui's radio show. When Yui makes her first pilgrimage from Tokyo to the wind phone in Otsuchi, she meets a widower, Takeshi, along the way. His daughter has gone mute from the trauma of losing her mother. Yui and Takeshi become friends and travel monthly to the phone booth by car. Yui meets visitors in the garden and listens to their narratives. I want to remark an effect of the road trip in the novel to prepare for the discussion of the road movie, The Windfall. While driving, Yui and Takeshi share their feelings of childcare, mundane things, and grief. Messina writes, those road trips from Tokyo to Otsuchi were the right length for their hearts to prepare for the encounter with the garden on the belly of Kujirayama, where the windfall is. I think this sentence suggests that sharing the same space and time for a while and talking to each other, or I'd say breathing together, are one of the processes of their morning work, which is similar to the road trip in the movie, as I mentioned later. Now let's move on to the movie, The Windfall, directed by Suwa Nobuhiro. The story follows Haru, who hitchhikes from Hiroshima to Otsuchi, her hometown, eight years after the tsunami washed her family away. In 2018, the Hiroshima area was hit by deadly torrential rain, causing many landslides, and Suwa films the opening scene in the devastated area, which reminds us of the Tohoku disaster in 2011. On her journey, Haru meets various people, such as Kurdish people living in Japan, local people in Fukushima, and one of the main characters, Morio, who had worked at Fukushima nuclear power plant and lost his family in that tsunami. Director Sua films the scenes when the characters share, their, share the same space and have a meal. They share their present or past circumstances at these dining tables. For example, an old woman in Hiroshima talks to Haru about her experience of the atomic bomb. And on the way to Otsuchi, Haru and Morio meet Kurdish families living in Japan. And they talk about their state of refugee and a father who is imprisoned by the Immigration Bureau of Japan. According to Nishijima Hidetoshi, who acts Morio, dining with the Kurdish people were, were heartbreaking because they are real Kurdish, not actors, and their hardship is not fictional. Since Suwa's direction has no specific script, actors have to improvise the play. So their dialogues often become spontaneous. Actors' spontaneous acts in the same space evoke unpredictable political connotations, such as the atomic bomb, which is a reminiscence of the nuclear fallout in Fukushima. Moreover, the state of mind of Kurdish refugees reminds us of the homelessness of the sufferers from the Tohoku disaster. 
Furthermore, in the car, Haru and Moryu share their grief, which suggests breathing together could be a healing process. In other words, sharing the same space and breathing together during the journey to Otsuchi could be a preparation for encountering their lost home and finally the wind phone, just like Yui in Messina's novel. Sua uses the weather and the insufficient ventilation of the car to express their loneliness and feeling of alienation. We can see the window pane misted over by breath. It's raining and seems to be chilly outside, so their breath make water drops on the window. The scene implies the break between the, the air inside the car and the outside. There also is a discrepancy between the mourner and the other people. Haru observes the city rebuilt after the earthquake through the window and says they are walking as if nothing happened. Regarding the use of the effect of the air to express their emotions, what is important is the interplay of the past and the present at Morio's half-abandoned house. Inside his house, the time has stood still since the earthquake. The shutters are closed and the air is stagnant. However, when Morio opens the window, air flows in. This is when the room trapped in the past intersects with the air of the present. In addition, Haru, standing in the doorway, sees her family in a vision. The figure of her family appears in the deserted garden of the present. Finally, Haru arrives at the wind phone and talks to her family in the booth. Haru's monologue is shot from the outside. Although this composition implies isolation from the outside, the phone booth is made of glass, allowing light to shine in, and at the same time, the sound of the wind is recorded as a natural sound in this scene. So we can find some connection between Haru and the outer world in this scene. The strength of the wind is even more pronounced in the location that Haru comes out of the booth. As we can see the sunlight blocked by the clouds and the swaying trees, the movie captures the strength of the wind in the garden. It creates an atmosphere as if an encounter between those living in the present and those who lived in the past is taking place. To sum up, Suba's movie suggests that sharing the atmosphere in which emotions float could be a healing process. And expressing their feelings in a certain space sometimes brings macro scale issues beyond private affairs. The air evokes the feeling of being connected to something, even though it is not directly connected. Perhaps paying attention to sharing the air allows us to reintroduce the story of individual loss, which has often been omitted from the recovery myth reported by media, the media. The air transmits human emotions and even connects the past with the present, the mortal with the immortal, and individual issues with political connotations. If you have any questions and comments, um, please email to me. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Japan Foundation for their generous support uh, that they have given us to the uh, US Japan Schol Junior Scholar Networking Group, uh, which enabled me to meet a group of wonderful scholars and uh, learning about uh, learn about the, their exciting work works. Um, also, I would like to uh, express my uh, special thanks to uh, Professor Karen Thombor, who's been an excellent mentor for all of us. And also, I would like to thank uh, Nobu, Genevieve, and Annie from Japan Foundation for their uh, hard work and um, a lot of effort and the time to, to make us all connected, stay connected in a lively manner. Um, despite the challenges that we face with ongoing pandemic. It is truly unfortunate that due to the current condition with the uh, COVID-19 in Japan, Japan-based scholars of our network, Wakana, Daijin, and I are only able to participate through video recordings. But I hope those of you who are right now in the room, attending in person, sharing the sparkling air of Honolulu in the moment are enjoying the panel. And although I'm not physically sharing the common air with you, I'm hoping my comments today allow me to put, take part in 
take part in the intellectual conspiracy and the coalition in which um, the panel tries to bring us together. The theme of this panel is conspiracies and coalitions in Japanese environmental humanities. And the overarching question is how we breathe together to create more livable worlds. The four excellent papers uh, meditate on this question by telling the unique stories of the air as well as those human and non-human members who share the common air. In reality, thinking of the, the present, uh, present marked by a number of challenges such as the war in Ukraine, pandemic, and global warming, and many others, creating more livable worlds is a difficult task to accomplish. But two anthropologists, Tim Choi and um, Natasha Meyer, discussed that the, through looking at the breathers of the common troubled air, there might be possibilities to imagine directions that help us to work together for creating more livable worlds. But as they also point out, forming a coalition among the breathers is not so easy, or rather a conundrum to so to speak. Among the four papers of this panel, three of them share the similar concern. In John's paper, he points out um, the issue points to the issue of a human's selective eyes on breathers. Yasui Takaya, the Japanese environmental activist, calls for an alliance with endemic species in order to think of the importance of protecting the precious environment of the Ogosawa Islands. But as he questions also, Yasui's preoccupation with endemic plant species exclude non-native species even though they are also dwellers of the islands and the victims of the development. In Alyssa's paper, inequality among the breathers is even more problematic in the case of the poison circulated, circulated through the air and the bananas. In the rhetoric of ethical consumerism, conscious consumers are supposed to imagine the circulation of a poison between the producers and consumers like those Japanese wives, mothers, and the environmental activists in one of the Alyssa's stories, they're encouraged to recognize the connection between the pesticides that causes serious health problems among the banana growers in the Philippines and the residues of the poisons on bananas sold in Japan that their children might eat their, in their hands. But as Alyssa argues, the actual level of harm is uncomparable between the two groups. Daichi's paper touches on the unequal share of a pain and grief at the local level based on the stories of the victims of March 11 disaster. As the story of the phone, wind phone indicates, disaster victims who live with the sorrows that are difficult to share with the others, not only those who uh, who not directly affected? Who, who were not directly affected by the disaster, but also other victims. Personally, I also encountered similar stories during my field work among the fishing families in northeastern Japan. Some people lost their family members and their homes, but others might have lost their homes, but not their family members. From the perspective of other people who live outside a disaster zone, these people are both the disaster victims. But there are often unspoken division in the air that makes the disaster victims feel the air is not collectively shared. So recognizing this, these um, difficulties, how can we form a coalition among diverse breathers in order to create the more livable worlds. For searching clues for this question, I found the Wakanas and the Daichi's papers are especially helpful. In particular, I argue their discussions on the collective healing and collective caring 
provides us an opportunity to extend our understanding of what the breathing together could mean. In Daiji's paper, he talks about breathing together as an act of healing together. As an example, Daiji introduces us a scene from the film, The Wind Phone, in which two disaster victims, Haru and Morio, drive together in a car on their way to the phone of the wind in Otsuchi. Daichi beautifully describes the contrast between the air circulates inside the car and the air outside. The air that Haru and Morio share becomes visible on the car window, which turns foggy as they breathe. The foggy car windows represent the divisions of the world between those who have a pain caused by the disaster and those who do not. But at the same time, the fogginess of a window also implies the possibility of a collective healing by breathing together through inhaling and exhaling the shared air. Breathing, breathing together is also an act of a caring together, as Wakanaza paper suggests. The bakers a couple in Totori Prefecture care for all the members in the surrounding environment, including not only local residents, but also the water, the soil, the plants, and microbes like wild yeast. Caring for others. The bakers a couple try to listen to the voices of others. In order to listen closely the various voices, they use not only their ears, but also all the senses that they can bring through carefully looking with their eyes, tasting on their tongues, touching with their skins, and also smelling with their noses. Healing together and caring together are ideal ways to breathe together for care, creating more livable worlds. But how can we care for others who we often fail to recognize? Like non-native plant species in Ogasawala Islands or banana growers in the Philippines. Perhaps if we could use our senses and listen to the voices of them, we might be able to conspire with them. But what do we do when we live far apart from each other? and that distance makes it difficult for us to use our senses to care for others. Here, I would like to conclude my presentation by mentioning two keywords that I think might be helpful for tackling the question. I suggest that, I suggest that networking and translation could be the keywords to consider the possibility of a caring for others in distance. In the members, as, as the members of the US Japan Junior Scholars Networking Group, we have stayed connected, even though we were not able to physically share the common air, but we have been breathing together, or at least that's how I have been feeling. Translation is tricky. We could often be lost in translation, but in order to care for others in distance, Translation is crucial. And one of the many things that I learned through breathing together with Japan US Junior Scholars is a unique role of us as a scholars of environmental humanities, as translators. Like Alisa's, who delivered her storytelling of the Filipino banana growers and their pains to Japanese consumers. We could have perhaps translate the voices of breathers in a way that allow other breathers to use their sensory imagination to care for others in distance. I stop here. Thank you very much. I also wanted to take a moment to thank Shimoyama Masaya, Minagawa Nobu, Genevieve Savage, Annie Waldman, and the rest of the Japan Foundation for starting the scholarly network and organizing the series of workshops that have culminated in this panel. Thank you to Karen Thornber, who guided us through these conversations, to my fellow discussant, Takahashi Satsuki, and the presenters, Elisa Paredes, John Pitt, Sugai Daichi, and Suzuki Wakana. It's been a privilege to learn so much from all of you this past year. 
My name is Sakura Christmas, and I'm an assistant professor of history and Asian studies at Bowdoin College. As the historian in this group, I'd like to offer one intellectual genealogy of the environmental humanities that we in Japan studies have to contend with in particular. And reflecting on Tim Choi and Natasha Mayers' call for a conspiracy of breathing with non-humans, let us return to earlier formulations of the air and wind. In Japan studies, one of the, the prevalent orientations is that of fudo. Fudo consists of the characters for wind, kaze, and earth, tsuchi, and has no single equivalence in the English language. We can render it variously as climate, kiko, environment, kankyo, landscape, fuge, milieu, miryu, scenery, keshiki, terrain, chike, and so on. The fu and fudo can mean wind or air, but it can also mean the appearance of atmosphere or way, and thus the compound might speak to Donna Haraway's formulation of nature culture, a term that recognizes that the entanglements between nature and culture are both biophysically and socially formed. The word fudo first entered regular use in the fifth century in China, in the history of the later Han, the Han Shu, to describe nature and culture on the various frontiers and their alien inhabitants. In Japan, the fledgling Nara court adopted the genre in the early eighth century in order to compose its own official gazetteer as part of consolidating state power over its outlying provinces. These accounts, Fudoki, contributed to the construction of geographic difference where the author's home became the implicit standard of comparison to which they identified the essential, the anomalous, and the particular of other places. The concept of fudo could also take on an active and even deterministic force in structuring societies. Notably, this argument gained potency through the work of the 17th century intellectual Wang Fuzhi, who asserted that differing geographic constitutions between Chinese and what he saw as the barbarians to the north generated divergent constitutions and thus divergent customs, behaviors, and characters. Wang's ideas resurfaced in the 19th century, bolstered by the introduction of Western geography as an academic discipline in China and in Japan. As I analyze in my own research, the concept of fudo helped reinvent Japanese political ideology in the 1930s, one that embraced an ultra-nationalist narrative of having a singular and harmonious relationship to nature. Crucially, Watsuji Tetsuro articulated this philosophy in his 1935 treatise, Fudo, a title often incompletely translated as climate and culture. As the philosopher David Johnson has recently written, for Watsuji, quote, there is no clear clean break in a Fudo between nature and culture. They are continuous with each other. At its ground, this is a place in nature distinct enough to engender correspondingly distinct large scale cultural forms, namely structures that are relatively stable and self-sustaining over time. Elements of Wachiji's thesis work their way into uh, Kokutai no Hongi, Fundamentals of Our National Polity, a co-authored proclamation of ultra-nationalist, if not fascist, ideology distributed by the Japanese Ministry of Education in 1937. Kokutai no Hongi revered the archipelago's nature and linked it directly to the soul of the Japanese people. For Watsuji, the state brought together and unified all of the places in a region that share a form of life to consolidate them in a national territory. So Watsuji's troubling work is one of the legacies we have inherited in Japan studies for the environmental humanities. It is part of the air that we breathe. Many of the informants today uh, introduced in our presentations continue to operate in this paradigm, either consciously or not. As Wakana presented, the owners of Tamari Bakery, the Watanabes, deliberately moved to Totori to use wild yeast only found in the forests and fields of their prefecture to bake their bread. Even though they seek to arrange local ecology through ideas about engi, they initiate farming practices to further purify the environment to ensure good fermentation. 
Similarly, John examines the activism against airport construction on Chichijima, in which protesters like the school teacher Yasui Takaya see as protecting just the endemic plant species on the Ogasawara Islands. As both Wakana and John critique, in the essential elemental exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide of plants and fungi, what is considered a good organism, one worth breathing with? Who has the privilege to decide? Which humans and other organisms belong to this community of the nation state? The presentations today seek to move past this discourse. Choi and Myers' conspiratorial framing emphasizes flows and distributions opening up an interconnected but ultimately uneven vision of environmental humanities that transcends the nation boundedness of Fudo. Elisa reveals the dangers of chemical drift, the fungicidal droplets that linger in the air from being sprayed onto bananas whose paralytic effects on Filipino farmers were unknown to Japanese consumers. Daichi explores the literature and film inspired by Sasaki Itaru's art installation, The Wind Phone. Here, the currents serve as a way to express grief and receive closure, not just among Japanese survivors of the March 11th disaster, but also Kurdish refugees who experience political violence at the hands of the nation state. Not only by Arabization programs or jihadist ideology in Syria, but also by the Immigration Bureau in Japan. Elisa and Daichi asks, as Satsuki also points out, who suffers? Who is allowed to suffer and why? All of these papers ruminate on the environmental politics of exclusion and the consequent violence in creating of these livable worlds, but in so doing, propose ways forward to reimagine coalitions in Japan studies in this era of climate crisis. Thank you for listening.